Dear Reverend Wilbert Audrey, Happy 109th birthday. Best wishes from Steamy with Glasses 1986 Rail TV Limited. Adventure of Helping to Save the Railway by the Reverend Wilbert Audrey. In February 1951, someone, I forget who, sent me a cutting from the Birmingham Mail which announced the formation of the society to save and operate the Tithlin Railway in Wales. This was something quite new. I was out of sympathy with BR nationalisation and felt that anything which could be done to preserve an independent well, it was, was worthy of support. Through distant cousins I had, as a boy, heard tales of, of a somewhat wayward little railway at Tawin. If, I thought, this railway was eccentric and indi individualistic, as the late Western Clevedon and Portishead, which I had previously known, its antiquatance would be well worth making. I was on the lookout for a supply of an off-beat real-life railway stories which could be used in my engine railway series of books begun in 1945. I wrote and asked for particulars, and when these were supplied, sent off my first subscription. I received a membership card and receipt dated February 22nd, 1951, and number 79. I still have that receipt and have a good mind to frame it, as it is number leads me to believe that I am amongst the first 100 members of the Tithlin Railway Preservation Society. At once I suggested to my wife that we should have our holiday in Tawin that year, only to find that she had already booked us in at Yarmouth, so we had to wait until 1952. The next year we arrived in Tawin, and after we settled in, we, that is Chris and I, found our Way to Wharf, where we found Tom, Rolt, and his wife Sonia. I introduced myself, saying I had written volunteering to help for one week of our holiday. Tom said he would be short of a guard the week after the next, so it was arranged. Then I asked permission for us to walk the track the next day on Sunday afternoon and he gave and this he gave. Christopher and I started a wharf and walked up to Pengray over newly laid track. Sounds from the workshop indicated something was going on, but as very new boys I felt a bit shy of pushing our way in to see. I was afraid, wrongly as I discovered later, that our curiosity would be resented. So we looked at the wagon standing out in the open, and then my eye was caught by a sheeted something in the barn. On closer inspection, we were excited to find it was Tithlin covered by a rick sheet. This we lifted photographed her and carefully replaced before going on through the crossing gates. This led to another stretch of relay track disappearing intensely under Tamois Bridge. We hadn't gone far when a large policeman confronted us saying we were trespassing. When I insisted we had permission he replied that he had not been informed of this, 
and since obstacles have been put on the track and other terms had damage made, he had been ordered to patrol the line and turn everybody away. However, in the end, he let us go on. And we walked up to Time War. By then, it was time to turn back. On Monday of the next week, I presented myself at Wharf in good time to learn what my duties as guard and booking clerk were to be. Tom Rolt's instructions were no doubt thorough, but I seem to remember that they went right over my head. I had to learn the job by doing it, making mistakes and taking the consequences, plus learning not to make them again. All the same, I enjoyed my week as a guard greatly. I enjoyed meeting fellow volunteers, rather different than the first who I found that most were as amateurs myself, doing the jobs they were asked to do to help keep the titling running. There was, I found, a wonderful commandery amongst us. While on the job, I found an unforgettable experience between stations to sit on the van floor with my feet on the step watching the train make its leisurely snake-like progress along the line, seeing the locomotive followed by each vehicle in turn negotiating inequalities in the track. First, the engine would roll from one side to another followed like the jolts of a caterpillar by each coach all down the train, so it was often possible to see at any one time the various vehicles each leaning in an opposite direction to the one in front of it. Added to this, loose rail joints would often make themselves felt in resounding bumps that would gave to all four wheels of the van. I recall that we lane had been done from wharf as far as town noir. Beyond that, except at, the st at stations, the track mostly appeared as a, to be its primitive, almost pri primeval state, overgrown with grass and brambles from untrimmed hedges. This was particularly evident on the open hill stretch between Dolgok, Woods, Quarry Siding and beyond. Here rail tops were sometimes invisible and were not and it weren't for the not for the slate fencing, the track bed was barely distinguishable from neighbouring fields with our locomotive finding her way it is, if it were, by faith alone. I made the usual mistakes, of course, both ticket and guard-wise, usually several different ones each day, most the charging wrong fares or forgetting the van break. My biggest mistake of all, one which was not for some time allowed to forget, was when I left the refreshment lady behind at Abergenolwyn. As an innovation in 1952, a lady volunteer would travel up on the 10.25 a.m. with freshmen to Abergenowin. She would stay there selling them till we took her back on the 4.50 p.m. down. The lady in charge during my week as guard was Mrs. Davis. She was Pop Davis's wife and Bill Oliver's mother-in-law. Whilst I was checking tickets and firmly fastening doors, she would usually stand in the station doorway, but on that fateful evening, she was not in full view. This must have happened on a Wednesday, as on that evening during the peak season, an extra evening train was run, and it was important that we should not leave late. I was 
so concerned about this that I forgot Mrs. Davis and gave Bill the right away. We had barely cleared the platform when I heard a frantic yell and there was Mrs. Davis, red in the face, arms waving, bustling out down the platform. I whistled to attract Bill's attention, but the sound was drowned by number four Edward Thomas's clatter. I tried screwing down the brake. It didn't stop the train, but the track att attracted Bill's attention and he propelled the track back to collect the fermenting, his fermenting mother-in-law. <laughs> she was too much out of breath to say much at first, but I heard all about it by the time we reached Wharf and Bill got his earful later, though we were later forgiven. That story was too good to waste, so with various alterations I used it in four little engines as Peter Sam and the refreshment lady. Since then, 37 years have passed, but my memories of my first count with the Tai Lin are still my most vivid. The Tai Lin spirit enchanted me with its mystique all of its own. That is the atmosphere I've tried to convey in my Scar Louis Railway books. These books are, in a sense, Tom Rolt's brainchild. Or, during our chats together at Wharf, he suggested that the Tithlin might feature in the engine series. We returned to the subject from time to time, but I was a bit not at all, as I couldn't see how it could fit in convincing at first. But by 1954 I saw how to do it and worked out a background with a close parallelism with the Tai Lin. It may be interesting to read to know that I had Tom Rolt in mind when I put the thin controller in charge of the Scar Louis Railway. For just as the thin controller had faith in the future of the Scarlery Railway through the lean years and refused to let it die, so also it was Tom, above all, who had faith in the future of the Talith Lynn.